Thank you very much. So, and good afternoon to you all. So uh, this particular talk uh, is uh, on uh, the statistical perspective that we have um, been developing over the years about uh, some aspects of mechanics, uh, thermodynamics, and the fluctuations that basically underlie the important feature of phase changes in solids or fluids. Uh, so uh, the fluctuations become very important uh, when you track such motions related to phase changes in solids. And a natural mathematical tool to model these fluctuations and hence stress the behavior of the material response or the transport parameters that uh, basically drive such a response during the phase change of materials. It is basically through a random process or stochastic process modeling. So it is precisely here that this statistical perspective to mechanics and thermodynamics become very important. Now, uh, okay, let us go to the next slide. How, okay, right here. Now, uh, let us just say a few words about why fluctuations are important. <clears throat> Now we know that, for example, if a body, a solid body for that matter, is in mechanical equilibrium, then uh, you can understand it, sense that equilibrium only by perturbing it about its equilibrium position. So small, in quotes, small fluctuations, that small needs to be mathematically defined properly. Without these fluctuations about the equilibrium configuration, there is no equilibrium that you can detect. The same thing is true for <clears throat> non-equilibrium cases. You know? For example, if you have a non-equilibrium steady state, then the fluctuations around this steady state uh, would basically bring out the properties of the material that basically led to the development of this uh, non-equilibrium steady state in the very first place under external loading or other conditions. So, uh, these fluctuations are of special significance in mesoscale, mesoscale objects. Uh, in these objects, uh, typically maybe uh, several nanometers, several hundreds of nanometers or so, thermal fluctu fluctuations can be very, can be, can be basically as big as uh, those, that is those fluctuations that arise because of this applied external forcing, like the mechanical forces or chemical potential based uh, forcing or things like that. And these fluctuations from two different sources, one from thermal sources and the other from forces, mechanically ap applied forces, they could interact in a non-trivial manner and change the very body itself. Uh, by that I mean the mesoscale object that you started off to begin with could turn into a completely different object. Uh, an FCC metal, for example, can become an HCP metal or something like that. The crystal the crystallographic structure may change. Many other types of other phase changes could occur. Plasticity can happen. Damage could occur and things like that. So these uh, these phase changes, which basically, uh, so we are typically interested in engineering with uh, these kind of phenomena in which phase changes occur so that it allows us to understand those changes and do the design. Uh, for example, if you think of damage in a solid body as a phase change or plastic bands, the formation of plastic bands as a signature of phase change, then without understanding how they develop through a model-based predictive tool, you won't be able to design the body properly against possible failure, right? So this is where basically an understanding from a mathematical and, and physical perspective of these fluctuations become important. And this is what we'll be trying to uh, understand as part of this talk. So uh, let us so let us understand overall. Then the fluctuations are related to the important transport properties in solids, and that's why we need to model them. Let us now give you an outline of what I'm going to speak in this talk. Um, first, 
uh, I will be constructing a few models to, basically that's all that we'll be doing, a few models to glean, to gather information uh, uh, that these fluctuations would reveal about the material or its changes, changes in the material structure. And we will relate these non-equilibrium fluctuations to certain universality clauses because physicists or mechanicians like universality clauses, you know, because these universality clauses underlie or reveal certain deeper aspects uh, which, 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 uh, which drive the mechanics of deformation, right? So the universality clause that we will be talking of in this is the fluctuation theorem, okay? Uh, this clause doesn't change from one type of deformation to another type of deformation, from one phase change to another type of phase change. And that's why, you know, uh, ideally these clauses should also be coordinate independent and things like that. So these clauses are therefore very important in the understanding of the mechanics, as we can demonstrate also partly in this talk. So let us just split these models into three types that I'll describe. One is I'll be developing, I'll be telling you about a generalized Langevin dynamics with uh, basically a multiplicative noise term that will be memory dependent. This Langevin dynamics will be derived uh, for an object which mimics tissues, a typical polyvinyl alcohol based object, which is often used by physicists to mimic tissue-like tissue -like organs, okay? And uh, we will show how you can arrive at a generalized Langevin dynamics of this type with a multiplicative noise with memory dependence, uh, starting from a purely continuum level model, okay? And from there on, we will show how the non-equilibrium fluctuations that are seen in the response of this Langevin dynamics can capture uh, quite non-intuitively the spatially non-local interactions uh, of the material particles that are in this object, okay? So one, this non-locality, that is the interaction of spatially separated points, material points, when they're interacting with each other whilst responding to external stimuli, this spatially, uh, spatial non-locality is related to a purely ten temporal description, which is the Langevin dynamics itself. So this non-intuitive non aspects basically will allow us to probably conclude something uh, which probably today is not yet fully understood. That is, by using a set of such multiplicative noise terms, one can probably describe uh, a lot of such phase changes in solids. Now, anyway, so the next part will be uh, uh, a model for plastic deformation, okay, in metals. And we'll show how one of these universality clauses, right, the fluctuation theorem, one can use to construct an equation that basically describes this phase change. For example, in this particular case, because the phase change occurs through plasticity, the plastic deformation in the solid, and we know that dislocations in metals are carriers of plasticity. We will try to derive the equations of motions for these dislocations using this fluctuation relation. And thirdly, uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, we will also talk about um, an extension or shall we say, a more generalized version of this fluctuation relation uh, based on, uh, based on uh, certain uh, tools such as the change of measures on the forward and time reversed dynamics of a Langevin particle, okay? So these are the three parts we will uh, take up in this talk. As I said, the first talk is on the internal noise by internal noise, I mean that multiplicative noise with a memory depend with memory dependence, right? History dependence. Uh, internal noise de driven generalized Langevin equation. I will uh, use the acronym GLE, okay, from a non-local continuum model and the consequences thereof. 
Now let us see what the problem is. You know, this particular problem came up when I was working uh, together with one of my colleagues, who is basically an experimental physicist. Physicist. Uh, he was interested in in phantoms. These phantoms are kind of a mimicry object for actual tissue-like materials, right? So they're made of polyvinyl alcohol. Now they're jelly-like materials, right? So they're polymeric, they have polymeric chain, chains, large molecules constituting the material. Um, but more than that, you know, while you make these PVA phantoms in the lab, uh, you introduce within this PVA phantom, sometimes uh, occluded air bubbles, or at some other times, you can introduce some polystyrene beads. Each bead will be typically of uh, um, one uh, mi micron dye or something like that. <clears throat> so you can see that these, you can think of, just to like, take a look at this uh, figure, you can think of these as, uh, these as uh, molecular chains, large molecules uh, with polystyrene beads, right? Now you can, these, these materials are mesoscale object, right? So these, these things like these molecules or these uh, beads. Now they therefore fluctuate quite visibly under a microscope or things like that um, under the ambient temperature driven fluctuations because the temperature is not zero, absolute zero, right? There is a finite temperature, outside temperature and that will uh, make these particles fluctuate, okay? What is even more important is that if you put an external force on this, which we do typically using two ultrasound beams with slightly different frequencies so, so that these two ultrasound beams enter this object and basically interact, interfere with each other in a small region, maybe about one millimeter cubed region, to create a mechanical force in the, in the range of uh, a frequency of uh, maybe one or two kilo, kilohertz, okay? Because there is a beating, even though the ultrasound frequency in itself is in, in terms of megahertz, uh, the difference between the two ultrasound frequencies will be in terms of kilohertz. So in that kilohertz, you can see this vibration occurring in that focal volume. We call that focal volume, that is the interference region of these two ultrasound beams also, as the region of interest, ROI, okay? So in that small ROI, you can create a mechanical force, an oscillatory mechanical force, a unidirectional oscillatory mechanical force. Now you can study experimentally using light. So you can pass light through this object. This object is transparent, right? So therefore light can pass through this object. But suppose uh, if there were no uh, vibrations, right? Then the light will pick up a path which is different from the path it will- Back to you. Sorry? Yeah, so the light will pick up a path which is different from uh, the uh, path that it will pick up if the particles are vibrating, right? Because the phase will change. The length over which the light rays, the photons travel, that will change. So that change basically is a signature of how much the vibration is or how much the displacement or deformation of the object is, okay? So you can capture that. So you can plot uh, because these deformations are highly uh, random. So you can plot the mean square displacement of uh, the acquired deformation versus time in the experiment, okay? Uh, this experiment has been done by one of my colleagues uh, with whom I have been working for quite some time. So you can see there are two curves here which are important. One in which this experiment has been done without any ultrasound, okay? There is no ultrasound forcing, but the, 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 random, vibe, uh, the random motion of the particles occurs because of the ambient thermal excitation, okay? And the other case, we have used the ultrasound beating to create the mechanical force for which you see the uh, plot of the mean square displacement versus time is rather different, quite palpably different from 
palpably different from that corresponding to the uh, no ultrasound case, okay? The third is a model-based prediction, so let us not bother about it, okay? So let us not bother about the blue curve in this case. Now, uh, it turns out that, uh, so we are interested in trying to model these things and extract information about the material properties of the object, okay? Uh, let us see how we do that. So this requires a little bit of background in mechanics, but I really won't be going into the details, therefore, because there is not much time for that. I would roughly tell you that, just take a look at these, uh, call them tracer particles or polystyrene beads or scattering centers or whatever, you know, these beads, right? Now they're under motion under some kind of motion, right? Because of this externally applied force. Now, the thing is that out of which, out of all these, you know, each one of these particles, if you just look carefully, it could translate during the motion, move from one point to the other, and it could independent of the translation rotate, okay? The order of this rotation typically would be an order smaller than the translation but it can still rotate quite independently. So therefore, the degrees of freedom associated with this particle is not just translation, but also what we call a micro rotation. And that can happen to each one of these. But we are interested in only one of these particles, call this as the system particle, okay? The other particles, including the effect of the molecular chains, you know, the, the, the long molecules that surround these uh, scattering particle, we can call as this bath, okay, the, which surrounds this particle. Uh, from a thermodynamic angle, they're considered as the bath, as a thermal bath, as part of a thermal bath. Now, uh, our objective is to understand uh, how from a continuum description, because we are looking at one millimeter cube kind of an object, an ROI, a region of interest, which is quite big, uh, almost a macro scale object. So it is best to start with infinity of such particles, right? A continuous distribution of them. That is a purely continuum model, which is basically, uh, which basically can be treated using standard methods of continuum mechanics, but with the difference that each particle, each material point will still have in addition to translational degree of freedom, also a micro rotation. So you see, if I construct a Hamiltonian for this system, you know, it will look something like this. Uh, it will have the usual, this term, the first term is basically an inertial force, partly contributed to by the translational uh, velocities and partly contributed to by the rotational spin rates, the rotational velocities, okay, which are omegas. And the other part is nothing but what you can loosely refer to as the uh, strain energy or the potential energy kind of a term, okay? These are related to the gradient of the deformation, which is called F, okay? And certain material properties such as the shear modulus and the modulus associated with these rotations of the particles, okay, of the continuum. So uh, you see, this is a continuum Hamiltonian, you know, here, for example, V is a function of X and T together. X is the spatial variable and T is the time. And so are the other, other variables, okay? Like F, omega, et cetera. Now we need a discretization, okay? So which we do, the details of which I completely leave here because uh, it's a short talk, uh, but, once you are able to discretize this, you, if you want to derive a Langevin, a generalized Langevin dynamics corresponding to this one system particle and restrict the dynamics only to reflect on the translational motion whilst accounting for the rotational effects, then what you need to do is that all the other degrees of freedom, all the other translations of other uh, uh, material points, as well as the rotational degree of freedom associated with 
this particular system particle have to be eliminated. Right, only then you will be getting a, a standard, a generalized Langevin dynamics only in terms of translation of this tracer particle, the system particle, right? This also we do, okay? And once you do this rather lengthy exercise, uh, which I'll write, like to skip because uh, of the constraints, obvious constraints here. The equation that you get is something like this. This is the, this is, so what is U? U is the displacement, the translational displacement of the system particle. All the other degrees of freedom have been eliminated whilst ac accounting for their effects, coupling effects on this particular U, okay? On the equation for U, the translational degree. So now, if you just take a look at this particular equation, you see some interesting things. This term, mu double dot, is a standard term. Okay, it is the uh, inertia term. Ku is a standard term. It is the uh, potential, uh, the, the, the force due to the potential half Ku square, right? Now, this term is again a standard term. It is basically the memory dependent uh, the effect that one observes in, 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 in the standard GLEs, okay? It is basically the viscous drag exerted on the, metri on the, on the system particle by the other bath particles, okay? FT is an external force. In this case, as I said, a deterministic external force is applied through the ultrasound beating. Xi t is an additive noise, which basically comes because of the randomness of the initial conditions. Why are the initial conditions random? Because of thermal fluctuations, okay? And what is important is this internal noise term. One gets a completely new thing. This term comes because of the coupling of the rotational and translational effects. Okay, and the consequent subsequent elimination of the rotational effect on the translation. And you see that this is a memory dependent noise, quite different from this viscous noise, a viscous term. Uh, and and uh, so that is basically a, the internal noise, which contains a lot of information on the mechanics of this body. Right, so why is this term so important? I will just now explain through some example, not examples, through some uh, numerical work and validation against, or, or rather benchmarking against some experiments done. So when we did this experiment on the stressor particle or the system part on, on, the, uh, on this TVA phantom, we got the mean square displacement under the ultrasound forcing, something like this, you see? So you see, initially, there is a transient phase in the mean square uh, displacement, followed by a steady state non-equilibrium phase, which is reflected in these fluctuations, right? Maybe there is a temporal mean to this fluctuation. But if you use a standard GLE, you won't be able to capture these fluctuations. These fluctuations essentially occur because of the micro rotational degrees of freedom in the model. That we can see because the micro rotational degrees of freedom leads to this particular noise term, which is the internal noise term. And if you remove this noise term, then the micro rotational effects on the translational degree of freedom U is gone and you won't get these fluctuations any longer. But it is also known to the mechanicians that these micro rotations uh, are a typical uh, source of non-locality. Micro rotational strain and the usual strain uh, due to translation uh, cannot be specified using a, a kind of an uncertainty principle one can show. They cannot be specified with, specified with equal confidence. So therefore, it is the micro rotation that produces a special form of non-locality, a long range interaction among the material points, okay? And here we are able to capture this. You can see this figure, the right hand side figure in which the experimental data is in uh, green uh, and the reconstructed uh, uh, the solution of the uh, uh, reconstruct the, the, the 
blue one, the blue graph is the reconstructed solution via the proposed generalized Langevin dynamics. Now you see how nicely, you know, one can actually capture this purely through a temper, a, a time dependent uh, uh, Langevin dynamics. One can capture what is happening uh, with specially separated points, right? That's a pretty non-trivial thing. This gives us a feeling, this particular work basically was published in Physical Review V quite some time back, about five years ago. But I thought that I would put this as part of my talk, right? So um, now uh, the thing is that uh, this probably gives us uh, the confidence that such multiplicative noise can reproduce with some ability to, uh, with some predictive fidelity, it can reproduce the effects of microstructural changes leading to a phase change in solids, often, sometimes not, in the dynamics of the local region. And uh, so that is the first part. So for more information on this particular thing, you can also look at our recent book on the ultrasound mediated imaging of soft materials. Uh, Right. It was published in 2018. Right. Okay. So basically, uh, you can, in this book, you can find more information on how the fluctuations of these kind of scattering centers reveal uh, much more information about this and the underlying dynamics of the transport and uh, the transport properties of the materials, because these models can be used to detect, because you, you see when cancer or in, at the incipience of cancer, when cancer occurs, um, you know, you have a change in the scattering centers of these, uh, these tissue-like objects, okay? So the property changes in the solid can be very well detected using such experiments uh, backed up by the kind of modeling that I talked about. Right, now we come to something from biomedical aspects, we come to uh, uh, something which is again related to fluctuations, but phase change in solids. Let us consider a metallic solid, copper, for example. Okay, and plasticity, okay, plastic deformation in solids. That is a phase change in solids because plastic deformation is quite irreversible. So mostly it is irreversible. It happens because of uh, essentially because of uh, the, the irreversible motion uh, precipitated in the case of metals by dislocations in the crystallographic structures which move irreversibly, okay? So uh, now let us see how we can exploit the notion of fluctuations during the motion of uh, the plasticity, during plastic deformation and get some useful information about the system behavior from there. Now, for motivation, we can go all the way back to the works of Boltzmann, Gibbs, etc. okay, on equilibrium thermodynamics and later on for near equilibrium thermodynamics by Kubo Onsager. Onsager was a Nobel laureate, if you right, probably you know that. Uh, so uh, this local equilibrium hypothesis and so on. But unfortunately, all this body of literature talks about small fluctuations about equilibrium, which is insufficient for us because plastic deformation creates no new equilibrium in the body. It's a non-equilibrium state for the body, right? So uh, we have to look for fluctuations far away from equilibrium if we have to model this. Unfortunately, quite, quite unfortunately, an accurate theory of non-equilibrium thermodynamics requiring uh, a considerable departure from the equilibrium dynamics. Equilibrium thermodynamics is, even though it is fundamentally important, but very little has been done on this. Uh, it is only in the last decade that uh, researchers have claimed to make some important progresses. I would like to put a question mark here because this progress, the word has to be properly qualified um, in the development uh, of the field. Uh, one of the significant results or seemingly significant result is the fluctuation theorem. Let us come to that. I was talking to you about the universality clause, right? 
this fluctuation theorem. What is that? Let us see. Basically, the fluctuation theorem uh, is a symmetry clause. It's a symmetry relation um, that provides us uh, with, 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 with a closure, a thermodynamic closure for any physical processes arbitrarily far from equilibrium. For example, you know that during any reversible process and uh, possible heat transfer to the bath, to the thermodynamic thermal bath, there will be entropy produced, okay? So the entropy produced, if you call it by delta S, and where is that? Yeah, delta S, then delta S is basically in the mesoscale level where these fluctuations occur. Uh, in the mesoscale level, because you see plastic deformation, even, even if you see for a very large body, but the incipient plastic deformation always works at the mesoscale, at a very small scale, right? Because it is just a collection of atoms which changes its motion type, okay, through dislocations. So uh, at that level, the entropy generated, which is called, or the total entropy change is called delta S, it is a random variable or a stochastic process in general. It evolves in time. That's why it's a stochastic process, right? So uh, there is a probability structure associated with this. You can apply a probability measure to describe these stochastic processes associated with this entropy generation and things like that. So if delta S is a random or a stochastic uh, process, then what the fluctuation relation tells us is that irrespective of how this delta is got created, be it plasticity, be it damage, be it change from solid to liquid or any phase change, this is always true. The expectation of the exponential of minus delta S is always equal to one. That's a non-trivial statement. If it is true, it's quite a non-trivial statement. In fact, uh, if you are aware of a little bit of thermodynamics, you know of the first two laws of thermodynamics, right? Using thermodynamics, we typically write down the motions of uh, the, the additional equations, which complete, which closes the equations for uh, balance of forces. Otherwise, you really cannot solve for the balance of forces without thermodynamic closure, right? And solve for the system dynamics in the process. Okay, so the second law of thermodynamics typically offers a way through an inequality. It says, the second law says that if entropy is produced, then the change of entropy must be, uh, the expectation of the change of entropy rather, must be greater than zero. That means entropy must increase in time overall. Right, overall. That doesn't mean that entropy cannot decrease in, 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 in small systems, but overall, okay, in a big enough system, entropy must increase in time. This is basically a much, much, this fluctuation relation basically is a much more nuanced statement of the second law containing the second law in its midst. For example, by applying Jensen's inequality to this, you can clearly see that because exponential is basically a, 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 a convex, convex function. So therefore one can clearly show by taking the expectation inside the exponent that uh, expectation of Delta S is greater than zero. Okay, so the second law is a part of this. So fluctuation theorem therefore is more general than the second law of thermodynamics, right? So let us try to use this second law, uh, the, uh, sorry, this fluctuation relation in trying to understand what we can about the uh, plastic deformation and the uh, information it can reveal, all right? Uh, we believe that using the fluctuation relation in lieu of the uh, second law is a much better way of modeling in the predictive modeling of system dynamics. Now, the specific fluctuation, I'm sorry for the ambiguity in the notations because delta S was the total entropy change, I said, right? The same quantity delta S is rep represented here by sigma, okay? It is basically delta S, nothing else. Now, this, 
one way of looking at this fluctuation relation theorem or fluctuation FT is also the following, okay? Suppose you look at a specific, specific part of the process in time. So time can be forward or you can come back reversed in time. It is like seeing a movie forward and reversed, okay? So uh, if you just take a look at the path, forward path, you take a look at how much of entropy is, is, is changed, okay? And then come back in the reversed path and take a look at how much of entropy is changed, okay? So PF sigma, the ratio of these two, which is basically a red on Nicodemus derivative because it's the ratio of two probabilities, is given by this exponential of the change of entropy. This is, from here again, it follows that the expectation of the exponential of change of entropy is equal to one. You can easily show that by basically multiplying this uh, with respect to, I mean, this proof is given here, actually, you can see that, okay. So from here, we can show that, just take, uh, the reverse of it. So exponential of minus sigma is therefore, you write an expression for that, okay? And you see, then you take the expectation of that with respect to the forward path, and then use the fact that the probability, whether forward or reverse, the total probability is always one, okay? So, uh, so the fluctuation relation that I was talking to you about here, this, okay? Uh, the last equation here basically comes as a result of this detailed fluctuation theorem. So this detailed fluctuation theorem is a more general representation of the previously noted fluctuation relation, okay? There is one, another interesting thing with this, you know, this sigma, as I told you, is basically the entropy change. That can be written as the logarithm of the forward probability divided by the reversed probability with reversed time for the same path, not for the same path. One is for the forward path and the other is for the reverse path. These two paths need not be the same, but you can write these two paths, the probability of these two paths in terms of a transition probability with respect to the initial condition times the probability of the initial condition itself because of the thermal fluctuations. And similarly, you can write for the reverse as well, right? Now you can, because there is a log here, because, right? So you can write them separately in terms of a difference of these transition probabilities for the forward and reverse paths and a difference of the initial and final total probabilities, right? And one can see that this first term in this, right, is basically due to the heating of the system. The second term is basically the entropy generated because of the modifications in the system due to irreversible motion of the dislocations. In this case, dislocations of plasticity. That is the system generated entropy, which doesn't get manifested in terms of heat, okay? Now, uh, so these two aspects of entropy, one is the entropy produced because of microstructural changes, and the other is the entropy that manifests itself in heating that through the interaction with the bath, okay? Which is a thermal bath. Now we give a model here for uh, basically how this kind of relation, this fluctuation theorem can be utilized in the context of viscoplasticity. We consider again a system, basically a metal, uh, which consists of two types of motion, right? During plastic deformation. One is a kinetic vibrational motion which is corresponding to the molecule, the, sorry, the atomic vibration because of thermal loading, right? For any finite temperature, there will be atomic vibration. And the other part is called the configurational subsystem, okay? It is denoted by the subscript C, which basically are the slower motions of the uh, microstructural defects, which finally lead to <clears throat> a phase change in solids. <clears throat> Okay, in this case, dislocations and things like that. There could be heat transfer from one to the other. And one can define the usual temperature, uh, theta K, that is the kinetic vibrational temperature, which you can measure using a thermometer. 
using the fact that this theta k is nothing but the partial derivative of the internal energy for this kinetic vibrational subsystem with respect to the entropy of this same system. Okay? That is how temperature is defined. A similar temperature, which cannot be measured, can be defined also for the configurational subsystem, okay, for the slow motion of relatively slower motion of this microstructure that you call as theta C, the configurational temperature that is delta UC by delta SC, something like that, okay. So one can define the two temperatures this way, one which can be measured and the other which is just a theoretical construct, okay, to do the modeling. And typically it turns out that theta C is much larger than theta K. And as long as that is the case, there will be heat transferred from here to here, okay? But when theta C becomes exactly equal to theta K, you say that, okay, no further plastic deformation will be there. And the system has reached a steady state. Or, or probably, I mean, no plastic deformation has occurred at all if theta c equal to theta k. Sometimes typically what happens, theta c is always greater than theta k if a steady state plastic deformation uh, is happening, okay, under some loading. If you remove the load, then typically what happens that after a long time, you will see that the plastic deformation will remain, but theta c will tend to become theta k, okay. Now, uh, so the heat transfer will stop. So these are some of the details of how we calculate the entropy due to the microstructural changes, the phase changes in the solids. In this particular case, it is because of the dislocations. So given uh, a, a, an, an energy level for the body, some internal energy for the body, if it is known, then corresponding to that known internal energy, how many different types of, micro, how many different microstructural configurations would lead to the same energy? If you can count that and call it omega, that number omega, then using Boltzmann type logic, the log of omega will be the entropy associated with the microstructural change, okay? So that's what we do and we can get some expressions for that. Here, rho is basically the dislocation density. So which we wish to evolve in order to understand how the plastic deformation is working. Then in order to uh, get an equation for this rho, that is the dislocation density, we use the first law of thermodynamics. We add, the first law of thermodynamics is nothing but a statement of the energy balance, okay? Here, the system consists of two subsystems. One is the configurational, the other is the kinetic vibrational, okay? So they add the two powers of the two subsystems under some external force, there will be power generated, right? So that is the total power, okay, for the total system. And that you can split in terms of the entropy and the corresponding temperature, or the rather the rate of entropy, uh, the rate of the change of, uh, of, of, of the internal energy with respect to the dislocation change, change in the dislocation density times rho dot, that is also another term, and this theta k sk dot. Theta k is the standard temperature, sk dot is the change in the kinetic vibrational um, the entropy, okay? So that is the first law. The second law simply states that uh, overall ST dot, that is the total entropy production must be greater than or equal to zero. The rate of it must be greater than or equal to zero. You can't really have negative entropy production, uh, negative, negative S dot, okay? So that we don't want to use, you know? We don't want to use this. We want to replace this second law because by, by the FT, by the universality clause for fluctuations the fluctuation relation. Now you can also write the first law in terms of an effective temperature evolution by this equation, but the details are not important here, okay? What is important is that in order to use the fluctuation relation in these, we have to decompose, we have to treat the variables such as the, uh, the configurational entropy, the, the rho, which is basically nothing but the dislocation density and the internal energy as stochastic processes. That is for each t, each time they're random variables and therefore can be split into a mean term and a fluctuation term, okay, of zero mean, okay, for all three of them. So F means fluctuation for each one of them, okay. And then you allow the process to happen for a specific realization 
and look at the changes in the entropy that is happening along that path, only along that path, don't average, okay? That is called the path space entropy production, which you can write in this way that I have shown here in terms of the internal energy, in terms of the rho, rho tilde, that is the, the but tilde means basically nothing but the stochastic, you know, uh, just to mean that it is basically treated as random, okay? And delta Q is basically the heat, basically the heating. Uh, this delta means the heat, basically change of heat is not a pure differential. It is an inexact differential, just to indicate that. Okay, so over a small time interval, therefore I can apply this path space entropy change. Uh, so divide that path into small time intervals like Richard Feynman did for his path integral formalism find out or, or consider this small change in the entropy over that small interval. So expectation of the exponential of minus of that entropy change should be equal to one. That's what the, uh, I, I showed you, right? Sometime back, this, this relationship, okay? Same thing, all right? Now, that's what we have used here, okay? And then we have used the mechanics of deformation, uh, some aspects of the mechanics of deformation of uh, these dis dislocations to write down the detailed expressions for this entropy change along that path, okay? Over a time interval of Ti to Ti plus one, just by integrating this equation, just by integrating this equation, okay? Once you do that, one can also approximately write the integral fluctuation relation. You remember what is integral fluctuation relation? This, okay? You just do some algebra on this. You can write it approximately as, as, as uh, the mean of this uh, entropy change, total entropy change is approximately equal to half the variance of that entropy, okay? Now you can write from this, the mean of the entropy, because you can basically have from this equation, you can take average expectation and write the mean. You can also write the variance of a sigma from the basic definition, but this would involve this variance, this quantity of the entropy generated or entropy change would involve two, two different parameters. One is the sigma squared, the, stand, the variance of the, the uh, configurational temperatures fluctuation, the fluctuation in the configurational temperature and the variance of the fluctuations in the dislocation density evolution, okay? So these two quantities are still unknown, unfortunately, okay? But one can, so if you know these two quantities like sigma square delta rho f and sigma square delta theta c f, then you would have been able to solve these two equations. But unfortunately you don't. But we can actually have some help from physics again or from physical observations. We make use of the fact that uh, the near the initial onset of plasticity, certain uh, universal behavior is observed you know, in the, by the experimentalist, something like that, okay? Forget about the details. I'm saying how to actually get to the truth here without even knowing what is the distribution function of the entropy generated, right? We don't know that. We are not assuming that it is Gaussian. And the second condition is that this relationship should be valid all the time, right? Even when there is a steady state. For steady state, this quantity is on the left will be equal to zero. Rho dot will be equal to zero and theta C dot will be equal to zero, okay? So using these two facts, one can derive expressions for uh, the, the fluctuations, sorry, the variance associated with these two quantities fluctuations. One is the dislocation densities fluctuation and the other is configurational temperatures fluctuations, okay? And then you see what we have got is something very remarkable in the sense that even without using the second law of thermodynamics, purely from a fluctuation perspective, we can reproduce results which match with experiments. This is on the left-hand side, you see a plot of the true stress versus true strain when plastic deformation occurs, okay? Now you see the matching is there and what is even more important is that 
Experimentalists often see that when the plastic deformation occurs, you know, you typically have at a certain strain rate, a certain bifurcation, a certain typical increase, a huge increase in the stress when the uh, strain rate approaches 10 to the power four or something. You see, even that can be reproduced. So you see the power of fluctuations and the universality clause that we have made use of in, 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 in describing the physics of solids, you see. This work is also available in this journal if you wish to see. You know. um, now, uh, the last thing that I'd like to take up is a question. You know, this work is still unpublished. We are still working on this. Um, whether the fluctuation relation that we have so far talked of is correct, or if that is an approximation to a more general uh, universality clause. Okay. Um, so, we can actually show, uh, I will show it in the context of a standard Langevin equation. You know, One can show that for a mesoscale system, it is not just because the entropy change for a mesoscale system is random. Delta S or gamma, whatever, is a random variable or a stochastic process. If the associated noise is of the Brownian type, for example, then it is expected that it is not just the no, not the increment of that uh, uh, entropy that plays a role in the fluctuation relation, but also up to order delta t, delta t is the change in time, the quadratic variation of uh, the change of entropy also should play a role in the fluctuation relation, right? Because the Brownian motion's quadratic is only proportional to change in time, right? Brownian motion is not differentiable uh, as a stochastic process in time. Yeah, so uh, we basically show that this is the, a more generalized version, therefore, of fluctuation relation. This is the quadratic correction, nothing but the quadratic uh, uh, variation in the random variable delta s at a given time. Right, so in order to show that, the showing it is not very difficult, you can consider, you know, uh, a standard colloidal particle. It can be shown in the context of so many different equations, you know. Just to give an idea of what basically is at stake, one can consider the simple, a simple colloidal particle uh, given by the standard Langevin dynamics. This is a viscous force. This is an external force according to certain, certain protocol. This is a potential whose uh, partial derivative with respect to X gives you the conservative force. So this force is conservative, this is non-conservative, all right. And this is the Brownian noise, all right. So the fluctuation dissipation relation tells us some uh, uh, something about the thermal bath, the strength of the thermal bath sigma square, that is the, this sigma, it's square, that is the coefficient associated with this noise is simply given in terms of the temperature of the bath and the viscous drag the visco viscosity constant, okay? Um, now, so this is the forward equation, okay? Now suppose you were to see the same movie. Why do I say movie? Because there is a response to this dynamics, right? So it's like a movie, right? Things are under motion. So you can see it in time reverse protocol as well. See it backwards, see the movie backwards. Then one can show under this standard transformation, uh, this with these backward variables, time reversed variables, one can show that the reversed dynamics is given by the same thing except for a small change, that is the CV, this viscous uh, force, uh, the sign of it changes, okay? That's all. So now consider both the dynamics together. This is important because we saw that the total entropy change is related through the ratio of the forward and time reverse dynamics, right? Log of that, okay? So now, you, what we try to do, we try to make the vector field associated with this drift vector of the forward dynamics the same as that of the reverse dynamics, reversed dynamics under a change of measure, all right? That's a very simple job to do. That means we wish to make this plus C in the forward dynamics. That can be done easily with a change of measure using Gersonov's theorem. And that leads to 
this forward dynamics. It is the same dynamics, but now we have a drift term added to the Brownian motion here, you see? If we wish to make this into a new Brownian motion under a change of measure, you know, that change of measure you can call as MT, which is the ratio of the reverse, time reversed probability and the forward probability of a given path. Okay, so and that MT can be written in terms of this equation, okay? This xi t is nothing but related to uh, this through this equation. Xi t is a random variable or a stochastic process for that matter, related to the viscosity, uh, the damping coefficient and the velocity, et cetera, okay? Now you see that, uh, so uh, this MT is basically a radon nicotine derivative, the ratio of two probabilities. And we know that a radon nicotine derivative, it is, if it is a stochastic process, it has the structure of an exponential martingale. That's another universality clause. It means, that the expectation of MT is always one, right? That's very non-trivial in this current context because now we have to see what is this xi t. If xi t is related to delta s, change of entropy, then we have proved what we, what we claimed, okay? So it indeed turns out that xi t which is basically you see here, okay? Sigma uh, dBT, dBT is a kind of a force, small force coming from the bath. Sigma is its strength. So sigma dBT is the actual value of the force, infinitesimal force. V times that force is nothing but the power, okay? That divided by time gives you the work done kind of thing, you know, or the entropy, okay? The entropy, yeah. So that entropy is the system or medium entropy. But in this case, if you consider, uh, this is a standard language in dynamics, right? So under local equilibrium hypothesis, we can also think of it as the negative of the work done. Okay, so that requires a little bit of logic, a little bit of further explanations if you have not followed. But you can see that this is basically something like the work done, okay? Divided by the temperature, okay? So it is related to the entropy. Uh, that that it corresponds to the actual is entropy change can be easily seen from this energy balance. So ET minus E zero is the change in the energy that must be equal to the heat generated plus the work done, okay? And now if as a special case, if you consider two equilibrium states, okay? Which are given by these two quantities, E zero and PT, then by taking logarithm and multiplying that by KBT, one can get E0 and ET, right? And that difference is therefore, you know, related to that difference is therefore this difference, you know, log P0 minus log PT is related to the work done, uh, is related to the total change in entropy, okay? Minus the heat that is taken out is the entropy generated due to the system. Okay, so that therefore gives you basically, so one can see therefore from this expression that xi t, uh, forget about the negative sign and all that, roughly is from the kind of rather, uh, rather, uh, rather, you know, in a, because we are almost running out of time. So the xi t is basically related to the change of entropy, but it's a stochastic change of entropy. So therefore this must be true. That is MT must be written instead of xi t, which I can write it as minus delta S. And therefore this is the generalized fluctuation relation that we automatically get. In such cases where this quadratic variation is very small or negligible, one can recover the usual fluctuation relation, all right? And you see that what happens in the Langevin dynamics, if you try to probe the system with a time integration scheme, which with a very small time step, right? you will see that this, because this is nothing but the solution corresponding to the Langevin dynamics. From the Langevin dynamics, the response of the Langevin dynamics, we have calculated delta S. And from that calculated delta S, we have calculated e to the, e to the power minus delta S and taken the expectation. Or we have calculated this whole quantity and taken the expectation from multiple simulations in a Monte Carlo setup, right? You see that the original one, you know, the original fluctuation relation as proposed by the other researchers so far, 
doesn't hold, it doesn't remain one, but the new one does. Okay, so this tells us that we need to take a closer look at the fluctuation relation still. And that is why I just used that question mark when I talked of these developments, striking developments in the modern times uh, beyond the work of Boltzmann and Gibbs. You know, these are the questions that comes up. So where do we go from here? These are the concluding slides. So, you know, the unfortunate thing is that we have passed well over a century. I think 130 years or more have passed, probably 133 years since Gibbs first published his work. Okay. And yet there is absolutely no understanding today as to what constitutes entropy. There are definitions, Callow, but to a physicist or a mechanician, one would like to relate entropy to something physically meaningful and experimentally verifiable, right? Uh, the way the arrow of time has been specified as the main cause of irreversibility is very unsatisfactory, simply because of the fact that it fails to implicate explicate upon the geometrical underpinnings because arrow of time happens in one dimension. In one dimension, there is no incompatibility possible, right? It is very well known that incompatibility, the lack of integrability could occur, a departure from Euclidianity could occur only in dimension two or more. So the arrow of time is not very satisfactory, okay, to explain things like entropy generation. The geometric perspective to non-equilibrium thermodynamics could be a very good way of, of trying to settle these long-standing issues. And it also will unveil in the process invariance and symmetry clauses. But how to do that, we don't know. At least we are still, still struggling, struggling on that. We know that work and heat differentials are not closed. Okay? These, are, these differentials are inexact differentials. Uh, that is over a loop, if you integrate these differentials, you don't come back to the same point. Then the question arises, if the origin of entropy uh, that we so desire to understand is related through Cartan's structure equations to the closure conditions of these differentials on an appropriately defined thermodynamic manifold. When these are questions, the answers to which will open up uh, probably a lot of things, um, uh, but uh, they need to be answered because at least if not for anything else, for the sake of predictive modeling of solids, which we so need to avoid very costly instrumentation and the experiments, right? So this work was carried out with help from some of my collaborators. One is Professor R.M. Fasu, uh, who is an experimental physicist from Indian Institute of Science. And two of my former students have contributed to it. One of them now is a faculty at IIT, Indian Institute of Technology, Rurki, and the other at Indian Institute of Technology, Indore. Thank you very much for your patience. And that's all I have to say. If there are any uh, questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. <laughs>